Hey, Nick, do you do that thing where you do like looping, like that Andrew Bird thing? Like if I sing something in the beginning, could you loop it to bring it back in the end? If you can, that'd be amazing. Because <clears throat> here it is. I'm gonna, 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 I'm gonna run all night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run all day. I'm gonna, I'll run a TV show. I'm gonna, so I get paid to play. I'm gonna, this is the show runner show. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Mm. Hey, you know, oh, thank you so much. Actually, you know what? I did the thing. You don't have to loop me like Andrew Bird because I looped myself. <laughs> well done. Well done. That's actually pretty catchy. <laughs> hey, thanks. Welcome to the Showrunner Show, where every week we demystify. I love that verb. I thought that was a really fun choice. Where every week we demystify some aspect of the job of show running. It's for anyone who works in TV, who wants to work in TV, or who just wants to know how it's all made. I'm Stacey Shabosky. I'm John Eric Dowdle, and we're so glad you're here. So this week will be uh, 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 week three of our pitch series. So this is, you know, five things to, you know, make your pitch more sellable. It's not that your pitch will need all of these things by any means. But each one of these things can help you, you know, just shift the odds, you know, 5% more in your favor or um, or more in some cases. And, you know, just so we, we thought we'd lay some of these out and just discuss those. The first one is my favorite. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. Okay. Number one, a big idea, a.k.a. a cool idea. John and I went back and forth on this one about whether to call it. He's like, let's call it a big idea. I'm like, no, but it's cool. You want something like... Like somebody explained that to us once. Um, oh, John was working on a, a pitch. John and Drew were working on a pitch where it was like a really cool thing. It was three young scientists and they were fun and they were edgy and it was like flatliners. They were like cool, you know, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, you know, fun brain implant stuff. And I remember your reps at the time were really excited to go out and sell it for you. And as they put it, they were like, look, this is a really like everybody wants to buy something cool. And this is really cool because they're young and they're good looking and they're a little edgy and it's sciencey and it's cool. Um, and no one is making that. Like no, no writers are out there selling something cool. And that really landed for me of like, oh, that makes sense. So for me, when I hear something like the big idea, I'm like, what is a big idea? What makes a big idea? But what makes a cool idea? I, I can wrap my head around that a little easier. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, I, I think too, like the... The cool idea, you know, someone once explained to me, like, these execs go to parties, they meet other execs, they meet other people out of the bit, like, they want something they can brag about, like, I have the new, this project, or, you know, we're working on a project that's so cool, we're, we're you know, it's this kind of a thing. So giving them the, uh, the party brag ability, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, like, whether that's working with cool people, whether that's working on cool projects, but for me, that... The idea of the big idea is, I'd say, beyond it being cool. You know what I mean? Like, the idea, like, I remember when, you know, years ago when we did the Poughkeepsie tapes, we could pitch that in one sentence. And it was, you know, our pitch at the time was, uh, you know, the Poughkeepsie tapes is a faux documentary on a serial killer's home movies. And you could just say that one sentence and just see anyone you said that to it would immediately like lapse into uh you you could see their eyes you know processing that and going oh shit that'll be really scary that'll be really you know yeah and having a a real visceral re reaction to the idea itself and i think that idea that is fun when you have a good idea and you pitch it and you can see that like people blank out for just a second and in my in my opinion what they're doing is they're going they're blanking out for just a second because they're going to the idea where the, going to the place where ideas come from and yeah. they are writing it for you do you know what i mean yeah. like yeah. that's what makes it so cool the light comes on because they go holy shit because they just blanked out for like one second and in that one second they personally came up with one or two or three scenes for the thing yeah. you just pitched it like, I'm not going to say it's easier, it writes itself, but it writes itself enough that you can do an elevator pitch and you could have a blue sky session with the person in the elevator before they reach their floor. 
Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, and I, I think something like that, like, I mean, so much of the calculus from the buyer perspective is how, how would this show cut through, you know, the market? There's so yeah. many things out there. Like how, what makes this special? What makes this unique? What makes this different from the other shows with, without it being like crazy, like, oh, you know, you know, the entire series is uh, one shot of a person's close. You know what I mean? There, there's a the bad version of a big idea. Um, yeah. But, you know, there there might be a way that would work. So like a hook, something yeah. sexy, something cool, something big. Yeah, but I'd say something that lets it cut through. Something that you could see, like, you know, when you look at the shows you watch, like what made you watch those shows? You know what mm. I mean? Uh like I just uh, watched, uh, I caught up to it pretty late, the Haunting on Hill House. And it's like, oh, it's it's siblings dealing with the trauma of like a haunted house in their childhood. And that's really interesting. That's such mm. an interesting, evocative hook. Mm. And, you know, I don't know how, you know, Flanagan, you know, pitched it or, you know, um, but I assume that would have been part of part of the pitch is that... You know, and that, yeah, yeah, the premise, like, and I've never seen something like that. I've Mm. never seen, you know, a a haunted house show or movie handled in that way. And uh, so it, it, you know, to me, that's a big idea. Or, uh, you know, we had a a religious crime family show we were pitching. And we're like, this is a, you know, crime family. This is a, a, you know, a show about uh, generational uh, civil war within this crime family. Like Mm. imagine if it was, uh, you know, the Sopranos and, you know, Tony Soprano is being overthrown by, you know, AJ, Chrissy and Nick in, um, and Meadow. Like Mm. if he was being overthrown by them, like what that show would be. And I haven't seen a crime show like that. And, uh, you know, so, so I think finding the, what makes this special, like, how would they market this? Like that, that's maybe another way of looking at it or like, why would you watch this show? What, what about this show would make you go, Oh, I haven't seen that before. You right. know? I think there are some things that will always sort of cut through at least, at least in my opinion, things like crime, uh, scary stuff, anything like thrilling or crime or, or, or uh, uh, things like that. But then if you add in like a nice big dollop of family or relationships or depth, that's yeah. pretty, I don't know. I guess they're, well, I guess. Well, I'd say even in those things though, like, you know, crime, for example, is one of the hardest things to sell. Like oh, really? he's an, inv- he's a, you know, homicide investigator who, you know, solves crimes. It's like, well, what, what about that is interesting? You mm. know, what, what, what's interesting about this homicide detective because crime works so well as a genre, we've seen so many variations of it. And there's so many pitches of people mm. pitching versions of the crime show we've all seen before. And there's a lot of people pitching those and a lot of shows that have been made, you know, it's be hard to pitch an NCIS or something like that and have someone go like, Ooh, that I've never seen that before. Um, you know, I still think those all need to cut through. Yeah. And if you see something like the killing cut through, like it was that relationship between the two of them was so special in that. And those hmm. characters were really rich and, you know, had an interesting spin that we hadn't seen before. Number two, strategic attachments. I thought this yeah. was really interesting. Yeah. So strategic attachments might, you know, might be uh, an actor. An actor could be a great strategic, you know, if you have a, a movie star that you know is interested in this kind of thing. And you're able to, you know, or a TV star and uh, able to get it in front of them and they, you know, sign on. That can be a huge, you know, if it's the right kind of person, you know, if it's the right person for the project. There are, you know, some instances where that doesn't necessarily help. Yeah, there are some instances I've, I've had personal experiences. I won't name any names. And we'll get to this in next week's episode, which is things to avoid in a pitch. But, you know, sometimes like you can get a famous person attached. Uh, I had a friend who got a famous person attached, very wonderful actor. 
And it turned out uh, women didn't want to work with this person and it was for a romantic lead. So that was actually an attachment which seemed like one of those great, wow, this is really going to move the project along. And no, no. In fact, it was like, uh, like, uh oh, reverse course, reverse course. Like it, yeah. it can't be this person. So, But overall, overall, I'd say like, you know, our season one of Waco, to use that as an example, uh, we had Mike Shannon and Taylor Kitsch attached to that and... That really helped. That really helped. You know, there was a, you know, there was a number of strikes against it as a pitch. It was period. It was a limited series. Like there was a lot of, you know, some things that were, you know, putting the thumb on the scale of, you know, exec saying no, it was an expensive show. Um, But having two stars like that really, really helped. And it really, uh, you know, really put it in a light and sort of showed that, you know, gave a sense of the tone of it too. Like it, Mm. you know, those actors, not just, you know, because of their, uh, uh, stardom or, you know, their value as a, you know, movie stars. Um, but they also, you know, they're, you know, they help cut through the marketing, you know, they help make the trailers special. Um, and, uh, it's understood that it's going to be a prestige piece that, you know, gives it that awardsy feel. Yeah, and someone like Taylor Kitsch like tells you this is gonna be kind of fun. You know what I mean? This is gonna yeah. this this isn't gonna just be uh I don't know, like a really like dry like yeah. yeah, exactly. And and see I was actually uh, gonna joke about that earlier when we were talking about the big idea and uh I didn't get a chance to, but I wanted to jump in and joke about like it's about a broccoli farmer, a homesteader going through menopause. Just like in terms <laughs> of like the least cool, least big idea. But then I was gonna joke, uh I hold on, see, I'm going back to the whole joke in my mind, that it's starring Francis McDormand. And you know what? Honestly, if it was about a broccoli farming home and started going through menopause, but you had Francis McDormand attached, you'd be like, okay, yeah, I'll at least hear the pitch. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'll and, program it, but yeah. And the, uh, the idea sounds, you know, at that point sounds so bad, but at least it sounds original. You know what I mean? It sounds original. You're like, okay, it must be something like, you know, when I heard the Breaking Bad pitch of like, it's a, you know, high school chemistry teacher starts cooking meth. I'm like, Oh, that's a crazy idea, but could that be awesome? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's oh, hard really? to imagine. Did that feel like a bad pitch to you? That sounds like a great pitch to me. Like, I feel like that's one that writes itself of like, oh, fish out of water, high stakes. Well, I think in retrospect, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, of course. You know, it, it seems like an of course, but it's like Brian Cranston, wait, the guy from Malcolm in the Middle, the dad mm. from Malcolm in the Middle with the back shaving. And you know what I mean? Like, I was like, that guy is a high school teacher cooking meth. Like mm. it, it was hard. Like in the first, first time I heard someone mention that, you know, it sounded quirky, if that makes sense. Where oh right, right. It it didn't sound like you thought the, it was going to be like adorable. Yeah, or just it's some, Zoe like, Deschanel as a meth dealer. Yeah, exactly. It had like I was. It was confusing, but I wanted to know more. Um, yeah, you know that. That was the kind of. Uh, I don't know, show people mentioned to each other. And obviously it was so perfectly executed that mm. so it's hard to imagine, you know, the state of television without that show having existed at this point. Like it's just such a, you know, pillar, um, you know, just a brilliant show. But Truth. yeah, when I first heard the pitch, I was like, could that, like, could that actually work? Strategic attachments could also occur. Like, like Drew and I had a historical thing we were developing and we're like, okay, we, you know, separate from Waco. And we, one of the things, you know, our agents were like, oh, you know, Smokehouse, like George Clooney's company could be a good partner for you, you know, in this, mm. um, because they're known for this kind of thing. Um, you know, so, you know, finding producers, you know, people who, uh, are meaningful in that kind of environment, you know, whatever you're trying to sell, uh, can be really, really helpful too. Um, yeah. so uh, I feel like or, sometimes early writers or young writers are very nervous about the idea of, um, at least I remember this from my youth, are very nervous about getting producers or people like that attached for fear that like, oh, you know, other people, like if we work with this producer, then that's basically closing the door on all those other, you know, possible relationships. But I don't, I don't think it really works that way. I think you're smart to suggest that somebody go to, uh, 
you know, potentially reach out to make a first pitch to a producer, because then you're still going to have to, even if the producer says yes and is into it, you're still going to have to go out and pitch to studios and networks. Do you know what I mean? And they can, if they're reputable, they can give you uh, a lot of clout and open a lot of doors for you. That's true. That's true. And, you know, producer, like a, a great producer can help you interpret notes, can kind of back channel with, you know, studios and networks to get more detail or more information. You know, sometimes they'll be like, oh, the execs are telling you this, but really the problem is their boss Mm. doesn't want anything in this area. So let's lean more away from that. Or, you know, there's just all kinds of clarity that a, a great producer can help you get. And a great producer can help be an engine that just drives uses their relationship to get more pitches, you know, True. or just keeps things moving, you know, mm. if, uh, in, in a way, sometimes it's, it's harder, uh, as a writer and individual to, to keep moving. I think um, you could also get your foot in the door. If you're like a new writer, an unknown writer, a young writer, it's probably easier to get your foot in the door with a production company. Like, for example, I would yeah. think, Okay, like we went out with Murder at State Fair and, you know, we were pitching to, we were eventually pitching to like the head of NBC or maybe she was the head of Peacock. I don't remember. But um, because I'm so terrible with the the businessy stuff. But if we had gone um, to a producer first, uh, there's a really good chance we would have been pitching to like a 26 year old just out of the mailroom new exec somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like, yeah. and and they are probably have more time in their schedule and are probably more open to hearing stuff. Another another yeah. good thing about and it was um, it just uh, for clarity, it was the head of acquisitions, not the actual head of. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, the the entire uh, you know um, NBC, but head of acquisitions still pretty pretty sweet. Yeah, pretty good. excellent. Pretty excellent. fancy Apple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to- very fancy <laughs> Apple. I just want to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, that's so yeah. good. I really am truly the worst uh, with proper nouns <laughs> and job titles. I pitched to somebody somewhere and she impressed me. Well, you know. well it's funny. But, uh, I'm bad at that too. Drew's always like, you know, we'll be going in for a meeting and Drew will be like, do you know how important this person is? I was like, I don't want to think about that. That stresses me out. <laughs> like, he's like, but this person's like a really important person. You know, it's like, no, no, stop. I, I just want to meet people as people. Um, you were talking about strategic attachments of going to producers and pitching to them and trying to get them attached. Yeah. Um, I would say another thing they can help you do is polish your pitch to go out to studios and networks. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's- Not only hopefully are they uh, well respected enough and have enough relationships that they can get you a lot of, you know, a quantity of places to pitch to, but they can help you work on the pitch itself. Like with um, the producers for Murder at the State Fair, again, are the Tandem Mom Company, who are so smart and so nice. Just wonderful people. If you get a chance to work people. with them, wonderful people. Wonderful people. And Jenna and Mel um, execs there at, what do you call them? Execs or producers? If it's production companies. Yeah. Execs. Two of the execs at a Tannenbaum company. Like we worked on the murder at the state fair pitch together with the visuals and the writing of it. I mean, we worked together on it for like a year and then, and then went out, uh, to studios and networks. Do you know what I mean? Or I'm sorry, we were, whatever. Nobody needs to know all the details, but they were so good at it. They helped me, uh, make a better pitch. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I'll use them as an example. A tan bomb company, like the times we've gone out with a pitch with them, like we have 10 times the number of people willing to hear a pitch if we have them, you know, if if we're doing it with them, because people love the tan bombs. They love, you yeah. know, um, working with them. And and so a lot of doors open that, you know, uh, Drew and I and Stace, like we aren't necessarily always open to us in every pitch. So they, mm. you know, they provide a lot of value in, yeah. in that alone and then refining the pitch. And yeah, they honestly, improve the was, quantity of pitches. They improve the quality of the pitch. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a, you know, both huge wins. And I, I'd say in the strategic attachments too, uh, I, I'd add two more things. Uh, one is a uh, showrunner potentially. Oh, yeah. like, like if you're going to show run this, um, you know, it, that could cut both ways. You know, if you're newly experienced, you know, like, you know, on the newer side and you haven't run a show before and you're like, I'm going to run this myself. Um, that can be, uh, 
you know, almost like, you know, writing a script and being like, I'm going to be the star. This is for me to star in and nobody else like that. That can also limit- I'm going to write all 10 episodes. <laughs> yeah, totally. To- and that that ha- has worked for people at times like, you know, Taylor Sheridan. But, you know, he had a, um, you know, a history of uh, writing and, and directing already. Mm. Um, and, you know, on Waco for us, like we wrote. We, we had written and directed multiple movies, but because season one was our first time doing it, um, they wanted uh, us to work with uh, another high level, right? Uh, an executive producing writer who, you know, we were like, oh, does this, you know, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean they're taking it away from us? Like we, we had some real misgivings and then he showed up and he was great. And uh, we learned so much from him and it was really, really a... a it was one of those uh, things I wouldn't have chosen, but was uh, life-changingly positive for me. Mm. And um, and so, yeah, I just want want to bring that up too. It doesn't mean like if they're like, hey, you know, we love your show, but we want, um, we, you know, we think uh, attaching a showrunner or somebody who's, you know, facilitated shows before, you know, like Matt Weiner on Mad Men had a, had a showrunner. What? Um, really? Yeah. So wow. like, he was a creator and he was kind of the one, you know, determining things. But there was somebody else like kind of keeping the wheels on the car and running things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Keeping it. That's very normal. I think that's yeah. a, I think there are so many examples where a creator, a new creator or new to TV um, yeah. is is paired up with a showrunner. Um, I think there's like a, a zillion examples of that. And that can be. Yeah. Uh, so helpful. So yeah, so, so that could be one of your strategic attachments. Yeah, and about- especially a showrunner with a, a a great track record. Like if you got you sure. know one of those high level showrunners who has worked in this genre and done you know this kind of thing, um, you know that that can really really move the needle on selling something. Um, and also, I, I'd say uh, uh, you know director or you know somebody like. If you're a writer who hasn't directed uh, and don't plan to direct, having, you know, like, a, you know, we interviewed Philip Noyce, like, like somebody at that, you know, at that tier, like a, you know, high level, they had Darabon for Walking Dead, which, you know, sure. uh, didn't turn out super great relationship wise, but, but it got it sold. And, yeah. you know, and it was a really well directed pilot. Um, and I know some of our listeners might be like, yeah, but I don't really have access to Frank Darabont. But you know what? A lot of our listeners w- do. Like, do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I'm personally, as you're listing people, I'm like, oh, I know that person. Oh, I know somebody who knows that person. Oh, I know that person. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you hang around long enough and, you know, even if you haven't broken in in all aspects, you know, chances are you've broken in somewhere, you know, you know. You've taken all those Groundlings classes and one of the people you went to school to Groundlings class with now has a show or your sibling knows somebody like like if you stick around long enough, you're going to have some connections and uh, and yeah, somebody might be willing to take a chance. I would say too, like as you um, strategically attach, you know, someone like a producer or somebody, you know they may have a lot of these contacts. They may be like, oh, we worked with this, you know. Yeah. You know, Leslie Linka Gladder, you know, on this, you know, previous show, she would be amazing as your pilot director. Great to work with. Let's see if she'd be interested. And you can, you know, as you attach people strategically, they may have contacts like, you know, Sal Stabile, who came into Waco season one. He's like, hey, I know John Leguizamo. Like, I worked with him before. Like, oh. I, I bet he I bet he'd be willing to do this role. And we're like, oh my God, that'd be amazing. And he reached out and John signed up and it was, you know, awesome. kind of mind blowing for us. And and then John was the one who was, you know, nominated for the Emmy at the end of it. And right. that was all, you know, you know, Sal Stabile, like he figured, you know, he made that happen for us and, uh, and we're so grateful for that. So, so I'm going to sum up strategic attachments, yeah. which is yeah. your attachments can be cast. Of course, that's the first thing people think of, but it can also be a producer. It can also be a director. Uh, it can also be a showrunner. All of yeah. those are, are potential strategic attachments. Let's go to number yeah. three for five things that, to make your pitch more sellable, which is truly special characters. 
Yeah, truly special characters. There's some overlap with the big idea and truly special characters, I think. Like, True. you know, you know, Breaking Bad, for an example. Like, that's a big idea. Like a high school, you know, chemistry teacher cooking meth. You know, right. that, is, that is a big idea. But, you know, in that, like, this character, he's turning 40, I think, 40 or 50. He's turning, uh, it's his birthday, he has, I can't remember. Uh, I think 50. You know, he finds out, you know, they're pregnant. He has a, you know, child with special needs. They don't have money. Like he's, you know, about to go broke. And then he sees, you know, through his DA, you know, DEA, you know, agent, brother-in-law, how much money some of these meth dealers make. And he comes up with a plan like, oh, what if I just dealt enough meth to like make sure my family's... Like, oh, and he knows he's dying. Like... These are all like, you know, big character things that, you know, he's working in a car wash at night to pay his mm-hmm. bills. And he's and he's got this anger, this, you know, this anger inside of him. Um, that there is no way that great character sprang into somebody's mind fully formed like that. That yeah. is that is the result of loving patient, creative rewrites. I did a, back when I was in acting school, I went to Carnegie Mellon School of Drama for acting and musical theater. And one of the exercises we did with our teacher, Janet, who was so great, Janet Morrison, was um, we were working on Chekhov. And we were doing like one of those actor warm-ups. I don't know if any, any of you are actors listening, but there are a lot of warm-ups that you do at the beginning of class where you sort of walk in a circle. Uh, everybody just sort of goes into their own head uh, as they walk in a circle and the teacher fills them up with things to think about. And Janet uh, was leading us through what it feels like to be a Chekhov character. Uh, I can't remember the play. I can't remember the character. But it was all these things of like, you are not engaged. The man you love is at the dinner party. You uh, just found out you've lost all your money. Your foot has fallen asleep. You have hiccups. Like, I can't, like, it was just, yeah. it took like 10 minutes of just layering on all the details of what makes this particular dinner party and this particular moment so fraught and tense, you know? And I feel, uh, and that was just to, to be able to put it into performance. But you can do, like, obviously a similar thing with your characters of just layer on what makes them lovable layer on what makes them specific, layer on what makes this a difficult time in their lives, the conflict, you know, the yeah. adversity they're up against. What what makes them fallible, their weaknesses and their, yeah. you know, because, vulnerabilities. You know, their vulnerabilities. I, I feel like, you know, a big part of the reason we love the people we love is because more because of their vulnerabilities than accomplishments. And mm. I would say the same is true for characters. Like we see these like, Oh, why are they doing that? You know, it's going to be so bad for them. <laughs> like, and you can't help but feel that, you know, empathy mm. um, towards them. And uh, and I I think just all those things, all the the ups and downs that makes like make them really special, make them really pop. I'd say one of the things that makes characters special too, uh, and attaches them to the big idea is irony. That was a, a like it is ironic that a chemistry teacher uh, would deal meth. Yes, it's apt because he has knowledge of chemistry and meth is a chemical product, but it's ironic because that's, you know, a teacher is a helper. A teacher is kind of nerdy and milk toasty. There is inherent irony, fish out of water irony there that makes you like lean in and go, ooh, what's that going to look like, you know? Yeah. Whereas there are other things like if you have a pitch and it's got a cool world or a cool you know, setting or something, but your character is just like, it's just a guy or the, you know, if they're generic, yeah. you've got a problem, right? You no, know, yeah. I won't say that you've got an opportunity. You've got an opportunity to make somebody not, uh, not generic and irony. Uh, that's a big save the cat thing, right? In the log lines that there can be a, a good log line has some inherent irony to it, usually based in who the character is like, Oh my God, that character in that setting, ho oh, oh, sparks will fly. Yeah, that's really good. And like, I think too, like when, if in a pitch, someone's like, well, why is this character doing these things? And the response is like, well, because that's their job. Like if that's a response, like you're a little dead in the water. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's important to like Joe Pickett was a game warden who we like to say 
was so determined to do the right thing because he was terrified if he did if he didn't that he'd become just like his father. Like so he's mm. doing the right thing almost too vigilantly and for all the wrong reasons. Mm. And and that gave, you know, a complexity, a human complexity um, you know, yes, he's writing people tickets for hunting violations, but he's doing it because with a rigidity that most people would not have, you know, because he's terrified of backsliding into who he believes he's potentially destined to become. And, mm. uh, and so we, we could talk to like his reason for doing the things he did, uh, Gives that meaning. weren't just duty or yeah. Like, you know, well, it's his job, you know, that's what <laughs> yeah. game wardens do. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, or like, I'm uh, thinking of law and order SVU. Love me, love me some SVU. Uh, yeah. We pretty much stopped watching it. Well, I mean, I'm sure they're making, they're still making it, right? It's not like a film. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but now we have kids, so we don't really watch it. <laughs> but we used to. I used to just gobble them up. And Olivia Benson, holy crap, beloved character. And she is, you know, a special victims unit investigator. She's investigating rape all day. And she herself is the product of a rape. You know, she was born, yeah. born from a mother who was raped. That's fucking genius. Oh, I shouldn't have said the yeah. F word. That's, that's so genius, you know? That is, that is, that's that kind of thing. Like what, you know, what is special about your character? In Like, I remember CSI, everyone was like, you know, oh, one of the characters in CSI, you know, used to be a prostitute. Now, you know, she's a cop. And it's like, that's awesome. You that's know what cool. I mean? Like, yeah, like that wasn't a show I personally gravitated towards, but I heard multiple people mention that detail. Like mm. that's, you know. That's not the big idea of the series, but that was the kind of hook that people like a great character like becomes part of the hook or, you know, yeah. X-Files, like his sister went missing in an unexplained way. And so he was always kind of searching for his sister. Mm. Um, that just gives that gives some great character dimension and the irony you're talking about, like, oh, yeah. he has a personal reason for caring about this. And God knows if you want a show to run a long time, chances are you're going to be dipping back into that character's backstory, whether it's meeting yeah. people from their past or flashing back to it or, or flash popping bits of trauma or, you know, having an interesting past, even, even if like, it sure comes in handy when you're on season yeah. 1 billion, it sure is nice yeah. to be able to dip into the character's past. Totally. Or like something like Monk, you know what I mean? That's a crime show, but it's a guy with debilitating OCD, you know, in a crime show, like as an there investigator. There was a bunch of those like, for a while. My parents loved all of them. Like it's an yeah. investigator, but they've got, or it's a, it's a, you know, a doctor or an investigator, but they've got like that one weird quirk, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that or stuff. One, one thing that makes it hard for them to do their jobs, but that's that still what they're showing up and doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I... Like, I think that, you know, the great, you know, truly special characters in that, in that world, like if you can, you know, add world plus the special character and you can see people's eyes go like, oh, that's such a, it never occurred to me, you know, the, you know, product of a, you know, an assault, you know, as one of the heads of the SVU, like that, you know, that kind of world plus character, um, mm -hmm you know, that, that alchemy can be really powerful. We're going to take it one step further though, because that was number three in our list of five yeah. was truly special characters, but number four, great relationships. You would think, oh, of course, a, of course, a great character is going to have great relationships. Not necessarily. I think in movies, there are a lot of great characters who it's just sort of them against the antagonist, but there's not, they don't really dig into relationships that much. TV, all about the relationships. Yeah. TV is all about the rela and the relationships and, you know, people getting closer and then breaking apart and, you know, aligning themselves with this person and that person. Like, that's what drives your series. That's what yeah. gives your series, you know, seasons, you know, or episodes, you know, three through 10 and, and totally. beyond. Like, is is shifting allegiances, you know, characters, yes. their secrets, their... Connections Let's talk to about each the good other. wife. Let's talk about the good wife because okay, the good wife, fantastic yep. character. I mean, yep. she was a lawyer. Now she's basically been a housewife and you know a, a politician's you know uh, dutiful, looks good on paper wife. But then he cheats and there's a big scandal. 
she slaps his face, you know, in the cold open, yeah. and that's the end. Yeah, she of... stands by his side on stage and then slaps his face in private. Yes. She's a, a, this dutiful wife, yes. you know what I mean? I took an Ellen Sandler class. She was really awesome. And she showed that as an example of how to write a good pilot. And, you know, you see the slap at the end of the cold open and the the title card comes up, The Good Wife. And she's like, and that's the end of The Good Wife. She was The Good Wife. She, you know what I mean? Like that's the end meaning, yes, it's called The Good Wife, but the whole series is going to be about how this good wife stops being such a goody goody and like gets her mojo back. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I just love that. I thought it was so good, but okay. So there's a great character, right? Yeah. But, and, and I bet initially nobody even thought of relationships. They just thought of maybe her relationship to her husband. Right. Mm-hmm. But it was just, God, that's an awesome character. The the woman who stands by her man in public and then slaps his face private. Great character. But then the show developed such good relationships. Like the boss who eventually hires her is her old boyfriend. You know, oh, good. Now yeah. we've got old romantic tension. Her mentor. And he's, I would say he's the real love of her life, not yes. the husband she ended up with. Yeah, and, so it ends up in this fantastic love triangle that spins out yeah. for years. And then her, and then she's got uh, this woman, this older woman who seems to be a mentor, but is really kind of a backstabbing mentor. You know, like, yeah. uh-oh, is this or woman sort of on goes her... back and forth. Yeah. She's both things at different times. Do we trust you know? her? Is she really going to help or not? And then yeah. she's got this colleague, this young peer. I forget everybody's names by now because Good Wife is 4,000 years ago and I'm the worst. But uh, the dude, Carrie. Carrie, yeah. that's her peer because he's also a first time associate, a first year associate. But of course, he's much, much younger than her because she spent all that time being the good wife. So now they've got this competition, right? But they've also, and he's kind of a bro, but so there's a little disrespect there, but there's also some respect, you know? And then mm-hmm. she's got this investigator with Kalinda, and that's, I mean, I mean, Kalinda's a fantastic character, right? Yeah. But it's also the relationship between them that there's sort of yeah. like a couple of broads drinking their bourbony drinks you know being yeah. tough together and a little sexual tension and kind of best friends like they're both kind of lone wolves who have best friends you know and then you throw the kids in then you got the mother so kalinda had had an affair with her husband back before she knew her oh i forgot you about know that. like yeah but like that all said there's so many great relationships yes. in you know, and they obviously thought through these relationships, like how is she going to get along with each of these different characters brought out a different side of her. And we yes. got to see a different shade of her personality, you know, accessed by her ex-husband, accessed by her her true love, accessed by her competitor, accessed by her friend, you her know, brother, like, her mother-in-law, her kids. Yeah, her kids in yeah. each one of them, a different relationship, like. And you were able to see this really multidimensional person as a result of all these relationships. And mm. and I, I would say, too, like looking at the concentric circles of relationships, like if you have a show and there's like 20, you know, or 10, you know, lead characters, say, and you can find ways to then put them closer and closer together, like family relationships go deeper you know what I mean? Like have more more ground they can cover than um, work relationships, for example. Mm. Like if you can, you know, make, um, you know, and the good wife, those aren't just like people she knew. They were, you know, people she worked with and they were family members. They were, you know, they were the people in her environment every day where if you can, you know, something like Hill House, these weren't like investigators investigating this haunting. You know what I mean? They were siblings. They had Mm. deep relationships with everyone in that house. You know what I mean? They had deep relationships all around the board and individual relationships with each other Mm. and different ways of reacting to different siblings. You can also Venn diagram it. You're talking about concentric circles of relationships, but you can also say it's like a workplace thing, right? Where you're not really, I mean, you know, it's like there's obviously got to be space in the world for like workplace pitches or friend pitches. For sure, for sure. But you can also Venn diagram it where there's some overlap, where there's some reason for someone in your family to visit you at work and not just visit, yeah. not just like, oh, so this is where you work. Oh, I like your office. But, you know, to actually have yeah. like a real, again, I'm thinking of the good wife of who was Eli, was that the character? 
Anyway, there was like this great yeah. lawyer yeah, yeah, yeah. spin doctor or spin doctor character who like, yes, she was now estranged from her husband, but they still had to put on a good political face. So then there was this, you know, sort of uh, the Alan Cumming character that would come and go. He created sort of a Venn diagram on top of them to connect them, you yeah. know, and then his daughter ends up working for the company and that there's another Venn diagram of like, oh, if there's a familiar relationship or romantic relationship and a work relationship sort of Venn diagramming each other. Yeah, like overlapping and overlapping. And then how That's a better way to say it. And you know, in you know, using the good wife as an example, like her best friend is somebody who works at the firm as an investigator. So all the investigative beats, like she also is a part of, and she also had an affair with her husband before they knew each other, and that becomes a secret. So there's just all these, you know, there's like a myriad of ways that these relationships are interconnected, even within that one relationship. Yeah, um, there's that's just so, true. so much, so much to do with that. So, you know, the more spider webby the relationships Ooh, can like be, that. and whether that's like making people siblings, whether that's you know, like uh, there there is a, a crime show called Simon Simon and Simon. Remember that? Like when of we were like in the se- I don't remember 70s. Ever watching it, but I remember and it, was, it was two brothers solving crimes. You know what ah. I mean? Like together and. They kind of got along half the time, didn't get along half the time. But there was something in that, you know, siblings doing a thing as opposed to workplace friends. You know what I mean? Like, well, let's go back to the Breaking Bad deeper. example. You know, yeah. the DE agent could have been, you know, it could have been the guy he ran into at the high school reunion. It could have been somebody. But no, it's his yeah. brother-in-law. Like, that's so yeah. smart. Now you can bring your conflict right to dinner, you know? Yeah. And as it gets worse and worse, like... His wife is now conflicted because she's that's her brother and this is her husband. And now she has to choose one of them as she, right. you know, comes to learn. Like it just it complicates relationships in an exponentially complicated manner, which you can just make so much of as the, you know. And I think that's part of what buyers are looking for is like, will there be an episode 15? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Like, like, how will this like not just resolve in two episodes and be done. Like how yeah. will this go forever? And and I think the the relationships um, and all the ways they connect is a big part of that. I just want to tack one thing on to relationships. We we promised ourselves for this one. We're like, we can we can bang this one out in 30 minutes. This will be a 30 minute and we just start yakking away. But just have to add this on. The relationships, it's also about changing allegiances. Again, I'm going to go back to, and and you don't have to worry about this too much in your pitch, but yeah. I think it's worth mentioning when you get to that section of your pitch, that's all about the great legs that your show has and how it's going to have interesting stuff to say and do for season after season, after season, after season, it's at least worth mentioning that all these awesome relationships have the flexibility and the potential to have shifting allegiances. Because The Good Wife, yeah. I mean, honestly, it was just season after season of like, this season carries her enemy because they're competing with each other. This year carries her friend because they're opening up a shop together. This season, you know, like, yeah. who was your enemy and who was your friend? Who was on your side? Who was on your team and who was on the other team? On that show, as with many good shows that have legs, it shifted every year. And yeah. I could watch that endlessly. Me too. Me too. Number five on the list, uh, one other thing that can make your pitch more sellable is some sort of IP. IP is intellectual property of some sort. Um, that's That could be a book, that could be a podcast uh, that you own, that you control. You know, it, it can be uh, the life rights of somebody. For our, for our season one of Waco, Drew and I had stumbled across uh, David Thibodeau's book, and, you know, it was, it was like this out of print book and nobody else was looking at, you know what I mean? Like, no, mm-hmm. like we were in a non-competitive, it wasn't like a New York times bestseller that had just come out. This is something that had come out, you know, 15 years before or something like that and had sort of run its course. And, um, you know, we found him on Facebook, reached out to him, flew to, you know, Bangor, Maine to, to meet with Thibodeau. And was this all with the goal of optioning it? This was with the goal of optioning it to mm-hmm. option it to, because we didn't just want to tell a generic, you know, Waco story. We want to tell his story. And that's yeah. kind of how we came into the whole thing was we're like, we want to tell this story. And as we went further, then we found, um, uh, 
Gary Nessner's book, uh, Stalling for Time. He is an FBI negotiator. So now we had a Branch Davidian's book and we went and uh, met with Nessner too and got, you know, you know, you were lucky enough to get his book also. And, but controlling those two pieces of IP made us the guys who were going to do that series. And then when we sold it, we so our deal was much, much better than it would have been if we just showed up uh, with a pitch, but with no uh, tangible object, yeah. you know, put us in a much better negotiating position. It just felt to people like the train was already moving. Yes. And I feel like that alone, like anything you can do to give that feeling like this series is going to happen. This is going to, this is going to be a thing. I mean, honestly, let's see. just go back to our body of work. There's like, I hadn't really thought of this, thought of this before, but Waco, you had those two pieces of intellectual property and then added yep. a new one for Waco season two, right? Yeah. Did yep. we end up optioning that? And then Joe Pickett, the Joe Pickett TV series obviously is based on the CJ Box book series. Right yep. now we're developing Murder at the State Fair for Hulu. That is based on a series of award-winning articles from the Des Moines Register. So yep. that was newspaper intellectual property. Yeah. Um, the, the Order. The crime family, uh, crime family one was uh, based on uh, an article in Rolling Stone. Yeah. Friday Night Lights, you know, where Drew and I are slated to direct uh, Friday Night Lights uh, reboot, um, you know, that's obviously got IP, like that has IP upon IP. And in fact, they actually sent out reporters to find a new town, create new IP, you know, to, to base this, uh, oh, yeah. uh the next series on, or the next, yeah. uh, movie on. I feel um, like there's always a sense, like you said, that the trains already going, cause I know some listeners will be like, yeah, is there nothing creative anymore? Is there nothing original? And I get that, but I feel like with intellectual property, First of all, there's a sense of authenticity and and truth mm -hmm. to it that, you know, that somebody's already put some artistic thought into it. It might even be based on something real. And then, yeah. like you said, there's there's a sense of momentum. There's like, oh, there's there's a path to – it feels like there's more of a path to production because there's already one stepping stone that's been laid down. It's not just yeah. like somebody showing up with an original idea. It's like, no, there was already a stepping stone. There was already an article or a book or a movie or a musical or something that's already been laid down. And now we're at the next step, which is converting it into television. I don't know. I just, yeah. it feels like more of a path to production. A lot of these, you know, whether it's a streamer or a network, like are corporate owned. And a lot of the times people want to be able to point at something and say, uh, well, we just bought The Last of Us. It's a video game. You know what I mean? We yeah. bought like this thing and we're converting it into a series. Like we, you know, whatever it is, like just something they can point at, not like, hey, you know, this guy had a great idea and we thought it was cool. And so we bought it and we're going to spend a bunch of money to make this series. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like something like the Joe Pickett series, like there's a proven audience for that. There's a, you know, an audience of people who love those books. They're all New York Times bestsellers. Yeah. Um, there's so many books like we could have, you know, done that series for, you know, 30 seasons. Um, yeah. There would have still been plenty to do. Um, that's true. Makes me sad. We only got two. Mm. But that's the way that's the way it you know, these things work. I want to jump in and say, if, if listeners are intimidated by the idea of like, oh, that's all well and good, but like, what I'm going to, you know, like I wait tables, I barely pay my rent. What am I going to hop on a plane and go option a novel? Like, what are you talking about? There's also, um, public domain, which is quite yeah. delicious, right? There are fairy tales and legends and, uh, or you can get yeah. life rights from someone. If you know someone personally with a fascinating story, you can try to do that. Uh, follow the House of Usher. John and I were just talking about that this morning. I've been watching that. Oh, my God. It's so enjoyable. It's just so delicious and fun. And every episode is based on a different Edgar Allan Poe work. You know, there's the Black Cat and there's uh, Annabelle Lee and there's the Telltale Heart. And that's got to be public domain, right? I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of that. And and so that, yeah, there's that. There's there's also, you know, there's kind of a whole industry of people too. Like, let's say you take a pitch out and it doesn't go, or you um, really believe in something but don't have the connect. Like, you can make a podcast of that, and mm. that then could become your own IP to sell your series. You know, that you could 
you know, write a book, write a story, write an article. Graphic um, novel. Graphic novel. Like you could do one of those things on your own. And in fact, you know, even like, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and he, you know, works at a, you know, runs a graphic novel company and Ridley Scott's doing a graphic novel to help him create IP to then own and sell, you know, into a show um, or movie. And it's like, you know, then you're getting paid twice. You're getting paid, you know, you're getting paid to do the thing. And someone's also like, and also, you know, a show where, you know, like for Thibodeau's book, like, you know, the Waco series, like advertised his book, like that book, you know, has done real business since um, he was essentially out of print. And now it's, you know, he's made, you know, money off that. Um, That's awesome. In, in a way, because uh, he owns that, the original IP of that. Yeah. And not only would there probably be residuals, but people want to go back. I assume there are residuals. Yeah. There's a, uh, well, there's uh, royalties. In a royalties, book. royalties, royalties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll add one bonus thing. Uh, number six. Uh, one thing that'll help make your pitch more sellable is a deep personal connection to the material. Like, what is the big why? What is the reason you need to tell this story? And really leaning into that. Like that, if there's something very deep in your life, you have a deep connection. Like, this is the story. Like, you know, as in the Johnny Cash movie, that, or, you know, they're like, you know, you can't tell me this is the the song you would play if this was the end of your life. You had one song in your life to play. Would it, this be your song? And then and then he starts busting out, uh, uh, is it Ring of Fire or something? You know, one of his like you know signature songs. And he's like, well, this is an original. And he starts playing that, mm. and it's like this this transformative moment. Like, what is if you had one pitch, one show, you know, you could do for the rest of your life? Is it this one? And if not, why aren't you pitching that one? You know mm. what I mean? Like, like, what is what is the reason you need to tell this story? Like, what is it like in you? Why is your whole life led to this moment? And mm. really getting into the deep personal connection you have to this material, I think is really, really important. And part of the reason the execs like will see you as a human being and be like, oh my God, well, I, you know, you know, this this story is, you know, set in the foster care system and this person was a foster kid. You know what I mean? Like mm. the execs would be like, oh my God, this person has a rich story to tell and will know how to tell it from the inside in a way that maybe nobody else on the planet could tell it. That's a fun idea to like, why aren't you telling the story? If you've got one amazing story that's so personal, why aren't you pitching that one? Part of me agrees with that and thinks that's awesome. And part of me is like, yeah, but, you know, as a working writer, you're probably going to be going out and pitching stuff, you know, once every year or two. Like, yeah, you know, let's say once a year ago. And, and probably they're not all going to be, they couldn't all be the one story you have to tell. However, you could bring that level of meaning and passion to it. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Give it that depth. Yes. That it's not just like, well, I'm showing up and I'm pitching you. A procedure about procedural about AI because I really want a bigger house and people like procedurals and AI is big. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, you can't totally, just totally. Like, you gotta like, bring some fire to it and some personal meaning. I gotta say, anytime Drew and I have had a you know, kind of quote unquote safety school project, like you know what I mean? Like, okay, our real project we love is this one over here, but we're also working on this one just in case that one doesn't happen like we'll have a backup like our backups never tend to work mm, even when our even when the ones we're really passionate about fall apart our backups don't actually help yeah. <laughs> typically like you know or historically for us it's like the like and we've learned to just more and more embrace like you know it's it's either fuck yes or no like yeah either like fuck yes, I love this. Like yeah, I would yeah, kill yeah. to do this series or no, I'm not going to yeah. spend my time on this because I can spend my time on, you know, on the fuck yes. Yeah. For a young writer, you know, when you're like, I'm coming up with my sample, I'm, I keep calling them specs, but what I really mean is sample. You know, when you're like, I'm going to work on something and you pretty much just, you come up with an idea, you're like, good enough, I'll do that one. Because you know, you're probably going to be writing two a year. You know, I think yeah. it's good to switch your mentality, perhaps, 
and to think, all right, I've got uh, 10 ideas on little strips of paper in my back pocket. Which one am I going to do? It's good to think about the fact that if you're actually going to go out and pitch this, it's going to take you at least a year, you know, from start to finish just to go out and pitch and sell the thing. And then God forbid somebody actually buys it. Then you're going to be working on it for another year, just developing it. And then if it actually goes... Do you know what I mean? Like, what's the idea? I can think of some ideas. I can definitely think of some movies I've written or some TV shows I've written as samples. I didn't think of them as samples at the time. I thought of them as just, I have an idea, I'm going to do it. But if somebody had been like, Stacy, if this goes, you are still going to be working on this four years from now, every day. I would have been like, ugh, no thanks. <laughs> you know, like, there are some ideas that I just, I'm like, work on it for three months? Fun. Sounds great. This is the idea I've got at the moment. This is the one I'm rolling with. But if somebody had mm-hmm. said, can you stick with it longer? I would have been no. I think that's very telling. Yeah. And maybe writers, young writers, new writers especially, should be like, ugh, am I willing to stick with this one? Am I willing to still be talking about this one and playing in this sandbox four years from now? You know? Yeah. Well, and I, I think part of that too, to your point, like try not to think so much like what I think w- might sell in the marketplace yeah. right now and think more like, what is the story I really want to tell? Like Stace, as you were pitching the, uh, you know, the broccoli farmer going through menopause, <laughs> I was like, I was like, you know what? If someone's like, this is the story I would kill to tell, <laughs> like, you know, you're not competing with like. 50 other broccoli farmer projects, <laughs> you, you are going to be, you know, you're not going to be in a competitive situation. It's either going to work or it's not, and yeah. it'll be its own thing. And I think so often when people are trying to, you know, like when Drew and I were doing like horror, you know, all the time, we're going back to it now, you know, in part, but, but when we were doing that, I can't tell you how many times it's like, well, that movie didn't work. Horror's dead. Like nobody's buying any horror. And mm. suddenly... Um, everyone would pivot away from her and we just kept doing what we were doing and mm. it was always wrong. You know, like Stace, you and I were told, you know, oh, nobody's buying limited series. And we brought out Murder at the State Fair and had a bidding war, you know, and it was a limited series. And right, right, right. I think, I think if you're telling the story you need to tell, you know, nobody was pitching a Waco project and nobody mm. was looking for a Waco project when we brought it out. It was it was a non-competitive situation. Um, and that really helped. It really, it made it singular. It made it surprising that somebody's bringing that, like, what, why, why would somebody, I thought I already knew that story. Why is somebody telling that? And having that deep personal connection, the big why, uh, really telling something you feel like, like almost like on a, like, like soul mission to tell, yeah. like that comes across in the room, you know, as opposed to like, well, people want, you know, brown suits. I'm going to make brown suits. Like, you know what I mean? If you're doing that, uh, that shows too. And so I, I would just caution, like, tell the thing you really want to tell. Like, and maybe like pay attention. I'm going to sell this procedural and then I'm going to write the thing I love, you know, right. like write the thing you love. So some people have just a very clear sense of what genre they want to work in, what tone they want to work in, who they are. Uh, some don't. I'm, I've definitely suffered from being like, you know, like, Stacy, what's your, what's your wheelhouse? What are you into? I'm like, I don't know. Good stuff. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I, I think if every pitch or every show you're developing is not just a product and a project, but also a chance for you to learn more about yourself, yeah. I think you can learn a lot about yourself what your wheelhouse is, what you're good at, what your future is going to hold by figuring out what you feel that passion for and what you don't. For example, I was like, I dipped into my own head for a second, thought, what are some of the things that I've worked on that I've pitched on or developed um, that if somebody had said, hey, you're still going to be working on this in four years, I would have been like, ugh, can't, <laughs> I just want to quit the business. And one of them was a rom-com. I really liked it. It was really fun. It was a really cool idea. I would have gladly spent three months in it. If somebody had wanted me to spend four years in it, no. Oh my God, no. And another one was a uh, touching family drama. I had written something that kind of cued me up to go out and pitch on this touching family drama. I really wanted it because just career-wise, I really wanted it. But if I had had to work in that for four years, I would have been miserable. And I would have known that at the time. And that's interesting to me. I can look at that now and go, ah, that tells me something 
about myself. Maybe I'm not meant to work in family dramas and maybe I'm not meant to work in romantic comedies, you know? Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? It, it teaches me something about myself. And even if you don't get a sale out of it, if you learn something about yourself as you're developing your pitch, that's probably good information to have. That is, that is. Yeah. Listen to yourself. Listen to yourself and what, what really gets you up in the morning. Because that, that'll be the thing you put the extra, yeah, you know, put the extra effort into. And the zhuzh. Has, yeah. Let's sum up the, uh, the the five things to make your pitch more sellable plus bonus. They are? Having a big idea, something that turns the lights on in people's eyes when you pitch it. Strategic attachments. Truly special characters. Great, great relationships. relationships. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't work uh, out who says what. This is a mess. Yeah. How <laughs> let's about, start from let's the go beginning. Back. Having a big idea, you know, something that, you know, you can see the lights go off, go on in people's eyes when you pitch it. Strategic attachments, whether it's to an actor, a producer, a showrunner, a director. Uh, number three, truly special characters, something that'll give your series legs. Number four, great relationships, because TV is not just about characters. TV is all about characters who have great, interesting relationships. Number five, intellectual property, if you, if you have access to that or can figure out some way to do that. And our bonus, number six, a deep personal connection to the material, a.k.a. your big why. Or as we learned in drama school, your big why. <laughs> uh, if you like our show, please consider taking a moment to subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. And please tell a friend. This all really helps us find our audience. Thank you. And we appreciate you being here. Au revoir.